Hello, hello. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, we're good? Yes. All righty. I hope all of you had a great weekend. And uh, it is now uh, week seven, July 6. Um, this is MED 110, 5DAX. So going forward, starting next week, all the classes will be on campus. And it will be on campus, fourth floor, uh, Alexandria campus in Health Lab 1. And that's on the fourth floor, right, right when you get out of the elevators, you make a right and you follow it around and it's the, the laboratory that's all glass. And uh, you'll see me there and I'll be there um, at least 15 minutes early. Um, and also have my, uh, have my cell phone on hand just in case there's there are any problems, like you can't make it, running late and whatnot. And if you can't make it physically, I need a call, I need a, a text something uh, beforehand um, uh, so that I can make at least a class available, um, you know, via Zoom so that, uh, you know, you won't be marked absent. Uh, but we'll be doing um, dissections and I'll be having um, uh, video lectures posted afterwards. So uh, it's in your best interest to come in, uh, especially in the next two weeks, week eight and week nine, because um, this is what you pay for uh, when you pay for your laboratory, uh, uh, laboratory stuff. And if you can't make it on that particular day, give me a call. Um, you know, you paid for this. Come in, or if you don't feel comfortable coming into a laboratory <clears throat> uh, with other people. But we have very stringent um, COVID protocols. And uh, pretty much you'll be scrubbing in and scrubbing out of the room as if it was um, a high-risk hospital area. So uh, wear something comfortable like uh, scrubs or, you know, um, we also have disposable, um, um, you know, smocks and we also have lab coats um, uh, if you want to borrow one. Um, but uh, I need to know uh, if you're not coming uh, so that, uh, you know, um, I can make sure the Zoom is up and running so at least you can watch the dissection and at least participate a little bit and also not lose out on attendance. But really, you should be there. This is the, this is the cool part of the class um, uh, where you get to really do uh, hands-on things. And I want you guys to do the hands-on stuff and then get out of there uh, because, um, yes, the majority of this country is uh, vaccinated. Um, all the staff and uh, I, uh, I think almost all the nurses are, are uh, even nurse candidates and nurse students are almost all of us are uh, vaccinated. Uh, but still, um, um, since there's still a pandemic, it's still uh, the protocols will still stand. So you got to wear your mask all the time and follow directions. As soon as you come into the classroom, I'll direct you to all the directions on the board on scrubbing in, gloving up. And um, so in all intents and purposes, you shouldn't be touching anything. And also do not bring a lot of personal items, uh, maybe your cell phone, your keys and a small bag. Uh, that's it. Um, that's also one of the directions we're going to have there on the board when you arrive to place all your items um, away from the work area. Um, yeah, vaccinated or not, uh, because all staff at uh, Stratford University, we're all vaccinated. We still have these stringent protocols until um, the Department of Health and the federal government say otherwise. Um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a good, also it's a good practice because when you're in the hospital, the um, everything's upgraded nowadays, uh, even the um, because of COVID, even the non-invasive procedures, you got you got to glove up, mask up and uh, put the face shield even for non-invasive procedures. Uh, uh, even like EKG, we got to glove up. Um, uh, I've never seen that before. Uh, but now, you know, this is a different world we're living in now. But uh, we do all that as a precaution. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to report in all of our time here since we've had our labs, we don't have a single contact trace on any student. All of our students who got COVID, I believe the count is up to like 13 of my advisees. Um, all of them got it at work. All of them work in a high-risk facility. And that's the funny part. 
everyone was gloved up everyone you know uh, because you know if you're those of you who already work in a facility you guys are already you know uh, a lot of ppe and a lot of procedures but um if you recall our anatomy and physiology lectures if you are immunocompromised you're going to get it so that's why we do ppe and all of these things to minimize contact as much as possible because if you're going to get it you're going to get it um and uh but we're going to try to minimize contact as much as possible. So um, again, if you're not gonna make it, or if you wanna schedule an alternative time uh, to come to the uh, come to the lab, um, uh, we can do that. I'm also available on Saturdays as well because um, um, I also do tutoring and stuff like that for the nurses. And many of the nurses can't make it uh, during the week because they work. Uh, so I have, Saturday, I have some Saturdays available. So if you can't make it, and again, it falls on the Tuesdays. So Tuesday, 9 a.m., fourth floor, Health Lab 1, Alexandria campus. And I'll put it in the announcements later today. So what's due today? Um, we have uh, week six items due today, which is task six, discussion six, and lesson six. And what are we doing today? Seven, we're going to do the respiratory system, chapter 22 in our textbook. And of course, all the parts, the structures, what is actually respiration, also known as gas exchange. And the two gases we're gonna be focusing on today is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And how do they go in and out of our lungs? So let's now go to our OpenStax textbook, chapter 22. Scroll down. Ugh, I hate when that Ever since I switched to a mouse, my track my trackpad on my Mac is super sensitive. So, structures, major functions. How does air go in and out? What is the physiology of it all? So, the first thing we have to understand is what is respiration. Respiration on any level is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen also can be written as O2. That we need that. We already know we need that a bit from our previous lectures because along with oxygen and glucose, you make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and I need that to live. That is the metabolic fuel, the metabolic gasoline that, um, that gets my body going. Okay. Now, uh, to, 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 you have, there are different levels of respiration. One level is um, atmospheric. You take in oxygen from the air, you inhale it, and then when you exhale, your lungs are going to kick out or, or exhale carbon dioxide. Okay, that is the atmospheric level. Another level is your lungs are going to have gas exchange in between your alveoli, and we're gonna talk about those structures, which are deep inside your lung, that and your uh, capillaries, which leads into your, um, your circulatory system. So that's another level. And we briefly mentioned about ATP, you have the cellular level, which is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide get exchanged for in order to make ATP. Because uh, if you recall, your, you have oxygen going into your cells, it eventually makes it to the mitochondria. The mitochondria, along with uh, oxygen and glucose, make ATP, and one of its byproducts or waste products is carbon dioxide. So that's why you have to constantly be breathing in order to uh, make ATP. And if you look at this lung structure, it's separated into two sections. You have your upper respiratory, which starts at your trachea, also known as your windpipe, on up. So your nasal uh, cavity, your oral cavity, your pharyngeal cavity, and your laryngeal area, which is your voice box, and the beginning part of your trachea, all of that is upper respiratory. So if you have an upper respiratory tract infection, that's everything from the trachea on up. Now, upper respiratory tract infections, they're not too bad. They're usually self-limiting. They go away, you, even if especially if they're viral, they'll go away within, you know, in two weeks, give or take. And it's called self-limiting. Means it'll, if you're, 
if you're not immunocompromised, your immune system should take care of itself. So if you have rhinitis or uh, pharyngitis, a sore throat, laryngitis, right? You know, when you have aphonia, can't talk too much, right? Any infection up there in sinusitis, uh, that's included up here as well. You know, your sinuses, uh, which are spaces in your skull. And if any of that gets infected, it's all right. But when you have any infection of your trachea on down to your lungs, now that's a lower respiratory tract infection. That's something of concern because now we're messing with uh, gas exchange and direct gas exchange. Because I mentioned that the gas exchange at the, at the lung level occurs deep within the lungs in, a, um, in an area called alveoli, which we'll talk about in a moment. So that alveoli, which is deep in your lungs, that's, uh, um, that's the real gas exchange. That's the stuff that's really important. So a lower respiratory tract infection that will affect your lungs is of great concern. And that area, right, um, uh, is called your respiratory zone. Okay, so that's deep inside your lungs. Now, what do your, lex your, your rest of your zone the rest of your lungs, your upper respiratory, uh, your upper respiratory especially, they kind of call that the dead zone. It's the dead zone because it doesn't necessarily deal with any gas exchange. When you uh, when you suck in oxygen here, it just it's just a, it's just a space where it gets to travel. The ga the real gas exchange occurs inside deep in the lungs, and that's why medically not too concerned about the upper respiratory tract infection. We're concerned when the upper respiratory tract infection descends and becomes a lower respiratory tract infection. And the lower respiratory tract infections, you know them well as COPD, which is emphysema and uh, chronic bronchitis. You can also have bronchitis, uh, pneumonia. There's a whole bunch of bad things that can happen here. Those are the kind of things that land you in um, um, the hospital and in the Department of Pul Pulmonary Medicine, also known as pulmonology, okay? So that's lower respiratory tract infection. And when you get an upper respiratory, we, that's what we're trying to prevent from it you know, descending and becoming a lower respiratory. So you look at your nose and the nose is important for breathing because if you have a deviated septum or your nares, which is here, that's the hole or opening, or your septal cartilage that's in here, if that's deviated or obstructing in some way, um, it's going to be, you're going to have a hard time breathing. I mean, any of you ever uh, get your nose busted? It's not fun. And uh, it'll prevent you from breathing. Or, or, or that's a more rare thing. Who gets into a fight and gets their nose, bu nose busted up? But all of us have a, had a cold before. And all of this can be, can be covered with mucus due to the uh, localized infection. You can also see here how there, there's these shelves called nasal conche. Conch is like a shell, right? But um, I look at it like a shelf, but uh, that's what a conch is. It's kind of like a, a, a shell, but they're like levels. And you can see how easily connected your uh, nasal area is to your brain through your cribriform plate, which is right here. And that's where uh, we're gonna talk about in anatomy and physiology too, how you smell things. And you can see all of this is all interrelated and part of your upper airway. So if you have any problem with uh, your oral cavity, you're gonna have a hard time breathing. Any problem with your nasal cavity, hard time breathing. If you have any obstruction here in your oral pharynx or your laryngeal pharynx here, right? Let's say cancer or uh, polyps, that's gonna give you some trouble with your breathing. Um, people with deviated septums, um, usually uh, uh, there are people who also have sleep apnea secondary to some obstruction through this pathway. Now, if you look at all the respiratory um, um, uh, epithelia, you know that inside your body, there's an inside skin and it's pseudostratified columnar epithelia, meaning they look like columns, if you look at it. They're kinda looking like columns. And what's on top of them, let's see you get a closer view. You have these little finger-like projections 
called cilia. Now, in these columns, you have these things that look like uh, kind of like a, a wine glass, and those are called goblet cells. They make mucus, and you have a nice thin mucosal lining here. Now, when you breathe in garbage, which we do all day, you know, air quality is of concern, especially in a closed building. And that's why the mask mandates uh, still include wearing your mask in a closed, uh, in a closed area, uh, like our lab. This traps all that dirt because you don't want that dirt or dust or foreign body to uh, get into your lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, or not infection, but your lower respiratory tract, like your trachea, your bronchus, and your lungs. So you got goblet cells, they make mucus, and they line all of this with mucus. And the cilia, it moves all the mucus down so you can get rid of it. And that's why, you know, when you feel something coming up, <clears throat> you know, when you cough or something, you, sh you should really spit it out because it's your body's way of trying to get that stuff out. Or how many times I, you know, especially with children, I'm always reminding my kids, like, instead of just, you know, picking your nose or rubbing your nose, blow your nose. And especially in the morning, because that has the overnight buildup of uh, all that mucus from the goblet cells and your cilia can only push it out so far. The rest is, uh, uh, the rest is up to you. And we, we like to promote in healthcare, um, uh, you know, you put it in a tissue paper and you discard the tissue paper. Don't keep it. Um, we have a lot of older patients who have, um, um, you know, uh, handkerchiefs. Try to get rid of that practice. It's so gross. Uh, and it's, it's a point source, for, point source for an infection. And do know and understand that mucus, even when dried, is good for 24 to 48 hours to spread the infection. And that's why we don't spit on the ground. Um, when you spit on the ground, the mucus is still good 24 to 48 hours, but this is the horrible part. When that mucus dries up, it flakes off and then flies around and that's how you get sick. Okay. Here is, uh, you're gonna look at this uh, next week during dissection. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, the different uh, laryngeal cartilage and we're gonna look at this little thing here called your epiglottis. That uh, epiglottis makes sure that no food goes down your trachea. And how do I know this is my trachea? This is the right lateral view. Therefore, this is the front of my patient and this is the posterior or back of my patient. In the front, you have your trachea with your uh, C-shaped rings, right? It keeps the airway nice and open. But when you're drinking or eating, this epiglottis will close down and you see this uh, little uh, muscular tube here that's very expandable. That is your esophagus or food tube. So when you are eating or drinking, try not to talk because then if you talk, your epiglottis will get confused and some of that food or drink might go down the wrong tube and it can cause you problems. It is also the, one of the many reasons why we ask you not to eat before surgery. Um, in surgery, the most common side effect of your anesthesia is vomiting and your pain meds too is vomiting. And what happens when you vomit this, a lot of this stuff comes up. And, uh, especially if you have muscle relaxants and, and other drugs in you, this might be too relaxed. And when you vomit up, some of that stuff may go down the wrong tube and then you'll get aspirational pneumonia, which is really hard to treat. Um, nice picture of your vocal cords. They're nice and relatively thin and light, but you could see easily if there's any fungus or bacteria or any pathology here, they'll get thickened and then that's when your voice goes bad. Now, this is your lower respiratory tract. It starts at your trachea and your trachea has C-shaped cartilaginous rings. Now, C-shaped because it wants to protect the front and it has to maintain that the back part is flexible for when you're eating things. This is called uh, your carina, C-A-R-I-N-A, or the bifurcation or the splitting of your trachea into two big tubes. On the right side, it's called your right bronchus 
or your right primary main stem bronchus. And on your left is your left primary main stem bronchus. And they call it like the stems, like a tree. Now you can see like the right is a lot shorter and fatter than the left. That's why the right is predisposed to um, foreign body. So let's say for example, um, you have asbestos in your house or you're a coal miner or you just got exposed to a lot of heavy particulates in the air. Well, that's gonna fall down and who's most likely gonna get hit first? Your right lung because uh, you could see it's shorter, fatter and wider here, this right main stem bronchus. Again, this is your carini, right main stem bronchus, left main stem bronchus. And when you talk about them together, the plural of bronchus is bronchi. Then like a tree, it separates down into branches, into secondary and then tertiary. And it gets, and as you go deeper into the lung, the cartilage gets less and less and less. And then the cartilage gets replaced by um, smooth muscle. And if you recall, smooth muscle, you can't control that, right? That's why bron like uh, someone who has bronchitis or somebody who has asthma, they can't control um, uh, their muscles here in their lungs. That is part of your autonomic nervous system. And if you look at the lining of your lungs, it's the same thing, pseudostratified columnar epithelia with goblet cells and cilia, okay? So there's mucus in there, but remember, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. Not enough mucus, you're not trapping a foreign body, and you're not um, keeping your um, uh, your visceral muscles moist. But too much mucus, well, we'll talk more about that in uh, you know in for future pathology. But we're gonna briefly mention it when we talk about um, you know what goes on in asthma and uh, bronchitis. Okay, so. That's how you can tell from a picture that this is your right lung, because you look at this right main stem bronchus, it's fatter and shorter, and uh, the left lung. Let's see now. Now, when you get deep, deep, deep into your terminal bronchial, when, it get, when those main stem uh, bronchi get smaller and smaller and smaller, the trachea gets replaced with smooth muscle. And at the end of these terminal bronchioles, you have these bunches of grapes, hence the term alveolar sac. Alveola in Latin means grapes or like a bunch of grapes. So this is the exact area of gas exchange. And we could see here, you have your, uh, pul you have a pulmonary um, artery, which is deoxygenated. You have your pulmonary vein, which is oxygenated. And then you have the capillaries in between. And at the level of the capillaries, that's when you have gas exchange, okay? The carbon dioxide from your pulmonary arteries uh, fills up the alveoli with carbon dioxide. You exhale and you... Hello? Hello? Got a question? Okay. Uh, so when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide. You wanna get rid of that. And then when you inhale, you're taking in oxygen. And then the oxygen goes into your pulmonary vein, back up to your heart, and then feeds the rest of your body. Now notice that when we talked about the cardiovascular system, veins were typically colored blue because they were deoxygenated and arteries were typically colored red. But if you see here in the pulmonary circulation, it's backwards. The pulmonary vein is oxygenated and the pulmonary artery is deoxygenated. That's a nice uh, question for future physio anatomy and physiology exams. Um, and where does gas exchange occur? It occurs at the capillaries in the alveolar sac. So you can now see why lower respiratory tract infections are way more dangerous than upper respiratory tract infections because it is the lower respiratory tract infection where you have conduction of and gas exchange between your oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, you can't hear me? Every, can anyone hear me? Check. Mike. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, my, because my mic is good. 
So, uh, Miss Lisa, maybe you might have to log in with your phone or uh, check to see um, your settings on your speaker. All right, so this is your alveoli, okay? Very important. So, and they're all here and they're really small. So you can now see if I have bronchitis, emphysema, pneumonia, uh, you know, any lower, lower respiratory tract infection, you could see how that would jeopardize this. And that's what it goes, and, and that's what makes it dangerous, a lower respiratory tract infection dangerous. And you could see here, if you look at the histology of it all, it's very delicate, isn't it? The walls are very thin. Look at your alveolar walls. They're only one cell thick. Look at your blood vessels. They're only one cell thick so that things can go in and out. So what if there's too much mucus in here or too much uh, fluid like water or pus or blood? Then you're going to have a real hard time um, uh, breathing. And those of us who've had any of these things like, um, like pneumonia, any lower respiratory tract infection, you knew how painful it was. I, I had pneumonia about two, three years ago. Wow, I don't, I, I don't wish that upon my worst enemy. All of this in pneumonia gets filled up with water and you feel like you're drowning. And it's just, and every, and every breath is painful. It's just, it's just really rough. And um, um, it's just, a, so just know and understand that it is the lower respiratory tract that, and the alveoli, that's the conduction zone. That's the important, uh, that's the main star of, of your lungs. Now, there's certain types of cells. You have type one and type two cells inside your, um, uh, inside your lungs. Now, uh, what's type one cells? Type one cells, um, uh, what's the best way to say it? Type one cells, um, help for gas exchange. I, I, I guess that's the, that's the easiest way uh, uh, to say it. But type two is really important, especially with newborns, because type two cells um, secrete this stuff called surfactant. Now, surfactant helps with surface tension of water. And because, uh, uh, and that's what helps uh, the gas exchange go in and out. Um, type one and type two cells. So premature babies, uh, such as myself, don't have these type twos. That's why you get put in an incubator and put on mechanical ventilation when you get out. And then they give you surfactant to, uh, I think I was in the incubator or something like that, four months, three months, something like that. Um, so type one cell, think what? Gas exchange. Type two cell, secretes surfactant and surfactant deals with surface tension. Both cells uh, um, um, facilitate gas exchange, the oxygen and carbon dioxide to be exchanged. Now, you also have inside your alveoli macrophages, because remember, these are one cell thick. If gas can go through these things, so can bacteria, foreign body, and other garbage. So we have alveolar macrophages, uh, which performs phagocytic functions. So it takes care of any pathogens that got by um, the rest of, uh, of the dead space or the non-conducting zone of mucus. Um, so it's now, it's like, you know, your backup, it's your backup garbage man for, for any of these problems here at the lungs. That's why when you get something like pneumonia, and uh, let's say, for example, uh, bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia, that's when your alveolar macrophage is going to be working over time because it wants to get rid of all of that. Now, this is just an FYI, not uh, because this is an anatomy and physiology class, but for your future pathology, uh, when you think uh, bronchial asthma or bronchitis, I want you to think way too much mucus. So this is a normal mucus mucosal layer. It's supposed to be thin, right? Your goblet cells were here, they look like little wine glasses, right? It's supposed to secrete just enough and then so that your cilia can move them along. But 
when you have chronic bronchitis and um, asthma, it gets really thick. Also, if you have cystic fibrosis, it not only gets thick, it gets, it's full of these fibers that make it very, very difficult to uh, release uh, from the system. And that's why you have to do physical therapy uh, for your lungs. So let's look at the lungs and we're, gonna, we're also gonna look at this as well uh, when we do dissections next week. If you uh, da, 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 uh, look at your uh, lung here, your right lung is different from your left lung. If you look at your left lung, there's a little notch. That's called your cardiac notch because remember your heart is a little bit on the left side. Well, not a little bit. It's majority of your heart is on the left side. So you have a cardiac notch here. You also have different lobes of your lungs. Now this is smart. Whoever built this was pretty smart. If you have different lobes, that means if you had cancer up here, your body would try to sequester or keep that cancer within the superior lobe. So on the right, you have a superior, middle, and inferior lobe. On the left, you have a, only a superior and inferior lobe, but you have the cardiac notch here. So if I showed this picture and I crossed all, I took all of this out, you should be able to label which one's right, which one's left, because the left has a cardiac notch and only has two lobes, and the right has um, uh, three lobes. So that's how you know this is the right, and this is the left, okay? Again, your trachea, and this is your carina, left main stem bronchus, right main stem bronchus. Now, your whole entire system the lungs itself are covered by a covering. And that covering is called your pleura. And within the pleura, there's two layers. You have your parietal layer and your visceral layer. And if you remember your medical terminology, viscera means guts. So now you know your, the inner layer or your guts layer has to be the visceral layer and the parietal layer is just the other one. And remember, when you have two things that are opposites or two things you're trying to remember, I only try to memorize one, like my life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other. And within, just like the heart, within the pleura, you have this uh, potential space, and it has some clear sterile pleural fluid to help lubricate and to help reduce friction of you breathing, because just imagine all that friction you're creating, breathing in and out all day, every day. Think about it, 12 to 20 breaths per minute, how many minutes in a day, how many minutes in a week and in a lifetime. But if anything gets in this uh, pleural, uh, pleural cavity or invades the, um, the parietal pleura and heaven forbid the viscera, you're gonna get pleuritis. And maybe some of you have already experienced this. Ever have a really bad cough and it feels like every time you cough, there's a knife going through your lungs or your, um, your sternum here. That's called pleurisy. That's how you know you have a, a pleuritic infection on top of your lung infection. Last time I had chronic bronchitis, it was like three, why do I wanna say three years all the time? No, it had to be like two years. Um, I had pleurisy, oh my Lordy. It felt like, <clears throat> it felt like sandpaper, rough, rough sandpaper was scratching me here and all throughout my lungs because my pleural cavity and my uh, pleura or the covering of my lungs was infected. We're gonna be talking a little bit more about these two muscles, your diaphragm. That's your thin muscle here that separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity and your intercostal muscles, which are the muscles in between uh, uh, your, uh, your, your ribs. So your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles play a very, very important part in breathing and those are the two main muscles of breathing. Doesn't that look like a both A and B question? Okay. So how do we actually breathe? Okay. Let me, one, two, three, four. Uh, let me see if I just have everybody. One, two, three, four, yeah. One, two, three, four, five. 
Okay, I got everybody. So this, um, this is our Boyle's law or gas laws. So what does it mean? Gas laws or Boyle's law means that pressure and volume are, um, are opposites of each other. So if you increase the pressure, the, vo uh, the volume should decrease like in here. That makes sense, right? If I press down, on my lungs or on, on, on a container, what will happen? The molecules will bounce around the walls even faster because there's less space. So as pressure increases, volume has to decrease, okay? And if I alleviate the pressure or the pressure decreases, the volume, it goes the volume, as you can see, gets bigger or the space gets bigger. So what Boyle's law is, it means that there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume, meaning when, when pressure goes up, volume has to go down and vice versa. Okay? And for future physics classes, um, they start adding math to this. So if anyone wants to go to medical school, uh, you need to know that. Uh, uh, give me a call so I can talk you out of it. So how do we breathe? Okay, let me see if I can, can I draw on this? You know what, I can draw on this if I do this, copy this image and I could put it on a Microsoft Word if it would let me, hello. So let's look at this long. A little, just a little bit bigger. Okay. Now, this is how we actually breathe. So, in order for um, um, uh, air to go in, okay, so let's draw. Let's say uh, if I inhale, now we also know that I really should get a pen for this, but the mouse should do. If I inhale, that means air has to do what? Has to go in. Right? That's inhalation. Because what do I want? Well, in the atmosphere, oxygen is about 21% of what we're breathing in, but I need it. And in order for that to happen, the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure has to be greater than the pressure on the inside. So if you look at here, the pressure here on the inside, right? Intraalveolar pressure. If my diaphragm right here drops down and my intercostal muscles expand my chest up and out, we learn from Boyle's law if the space or volume gets bigger, right? What has to get smaller? The pressure. So the pressure here, why can't I draw? Right. The pressure inside here will become negative. What's going on here? So what has to happen? Your diaphragm goes down. Your intercostal muscles go up and out. 
that will create a negative pressure on both sides of my lungs. My atmospheric pressure is greater than a negative pressure. Therefore, all the air should go in. Everyone take a good breath. Do you notice how your chest moves a little up and out? And what happens? The diaphragm is gonna drop down and everything's gonna move up, making this area much, much bigger. Hence, negative pressure, okay? And if you have a negative pressure, you should what? Inhale. Now, inhale as much as you can and try to hold it in. Now, what happens when I'm inhaling? The pressure in here, after a while, is going to be immensely positive. You know, at the top, when I hold my breath, and then what's gonna happen? Then it's going to, the pressure, the positive pressure is going to be much greater than the atmospheric pressure. Therefore, what will happen? I will exhale. Now, how can I answer that? How, how can I ask this on an exam? Oh, well, first we have to talk about its significance, okay? Now you know that your lungs are a closed system, right? And um, pressures dictate how you breathe. Well, naturally, because, and these muscles here, you have semi-control of them, okay? Your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm. So in order, you, in order for you to inhale, it has to create a negative pressure. And then at the very, very top, that negative pressure will become increasingly positive at the top of your inhalation where you can't hold it any longer. And then what happens? You have to let go. Exhale. Now, when you exhale, it should be passive. All you have to do is just let go. Well, it happens automatically. When you inhale, it's something active because I have to contract my diaphragm muscle and my intercostal muscles to make my lungs negative. So what will happen, now you guys know how sucking chest wounds, or um, if there's any obstruction, but uh, most common application of this is a sucking chest wound. Like let's say my patient got shot or my patient got stabbed in the chest. Now you're opening up these lungs to the outside pressures. And that's a problem because now there's no pressure gradient for you to breathe. And then my patient is gonna go into dyspnea or SOB, shortness of breath really fast. Um, and that's exactly what happens when you get stabbed or when, if there's a communication between this and the outside world. So how could I ask this on an exam? What is it goes, what is the atmospheric pressure when you inhale? Is it greater than, equal than, or less than to your, uh, your intro, um, your, um, your pulmonary pressure? And you'll say what? It's greater than. The pulmonary pressure is positive, negative, or equal when, uh, when you're inhaling, it's negative. When you're exhaling, oh, inhale, of course, is what? Active, because I have to use my, uh, my, uh, my muscles, the diaphragm and the um, your diaphragm here and your uh, intercostal muscles. Now, I could, uh, you could ask the very exact opposite. Upon exhalation, what is, uh, what is the pressure of your lungs? It's immensely positive. It goes, what is the, uh, uh, it's positive. It goes, what is the atmospheric pressure? 
it's decreased compared to the inside or your pleural, of, um, not pleural, um, uh, your pulmonary pressure. Therefore, your, the gas will leave your lungs, you will exhale, and it's passive because it doesn't require any, um, um, any muscles. And that's how I also know that there's a pathology. If my patient is forcing themselves to breathe, like in dyspnea, then I know something's wrong. Now, you see these numbers? For your future, are you future nurses? When you're in your pathology class, they start putting numbers. And you now you could see, you, you, you can sit and memorize the numbers, but, uh, but uh, almost always they start messing up which is negative, which is positive. But if you can understand that on, upon inhalation, because uh, these numbers have to be negative, as you can see here, negative 756, negative four, it goes, uh, and zero intra-alveolar pressure versus what? And then uh, um, the exact opposite when it comes out here. But for my exam, no numbers, just do you know which one's active, which one's passive? Which one has greater atmospheric pressure? Which one has lesser atmospheric pressure? And this is all because of Boyle's law, the inverse relationship between your uh, pressure and volume volume of your lungs and uh, the pressures. And you know that gas can only happen, uh, can only move from, uh, from an area of high concentration to a layer area of low concentration. And the same happens when it goes in and inside and out of your um, alveoli and your, um, uh, what do you call that? Why am I scrolling as if this is the book? No, this is the book. So when you see this, now you know. Uh, da, 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 da. Here's another um, view of inhalation ex uh, expiration. You could see inhalation. You need contraction of your diaphragm and your uh, external intercostal muscles have to go up and out. Now what happens in expiration? Diaphragm relaxes, intercostal muscles relax, and then you expire, okay? So inhalation is active. Exhalation is passive. Now this, future nurses, you're gonna have to memorize, uh, but for now, uh, curriculum doesn't say you have to, but for right now, the worst I need for you to know is what do these things mean? Um, of course, a thousand milliliters is one liter. So that's one liter, two, three, four, five, six. Now, what are these things? Your normal quiet breathing is around, uh, I don't know, uh, 300, 400 cc's or um, uh, 30, uh, 0 0.3 liters or something like that, right? Tid you need to know that tidal volume is your normal quiet breathing. Your inspiratory reserve volume is um, uh, like, like, you know, when you're breathing, you can inhale a whole bunch more, right? Like I'm breathing normally and then what? <clears throat> and you have to try to inhale as much as you possibly can. Now your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume is called your inspiratory capacity. Now, what's your expiratory reserve volume, right? That's the amount of air that you can <sighs> exhale out the maximum then you always have about a liter or so residual volume that just stays in your lungs to give your, because it's, it's your lung volume. Um, it just keeps you, you know, while your lungs are nice and open because of the pressures, this is just what's left, uh, what's left over. Now your expiratory reserve volume, also known as your ERV and your residual volume, known as your RV, that equals your FRC, which is your functional residual capacity. In pulmonology, they use, um, they use uh, the initials like, uh, inspiratory reserve volume would be IRV, tidal volume would be TV, and inspiratory capacity would be IC. So it's IC equals TV plus IRV, FRC equals ERV plus RV. And eventually you're gonna have to memorize, uh, um, memorize all of this. But for my exam, just know, like if I ask you, what's tidal volume? Oh, that's the normal volume that I'm, when I'm breathing. What's inspiratory reserve volume? That's the rest of my lung capacity if I try to inhale my maximum. What's expiratory reserve volume? 
that's the um, um, uh, the amount of uh, lung reserve when I exhale. And residual volume is the extra volume of uh, um, of space in my lungs that's uh, that's just there all the time. Total lung capacity are all of these volumes. Vital capacity is your expiratory, inspiratory, plus your tidal volume. And I'm not going to ask for numbers. I'm just going to ask you, uh, like, what equals what and what is what, right? Um, so here's a nice question. Uh, my patient is just breathing normally, uh, 15 breaths per minute. Which of the following volumes are most applicable to his quiet breathing? Tidal volume. I asked my patient during a pulmonology test to... Uh, to uh, inhale as much as they can. Which volume am I measuring? Inspiratory reserve volume. I then, after some, a period, have uh, my patient relax and then try to exhale as much as they can. That's the expiratory reserve volume. And expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve is what? Your vital capacity. Total lung capacity is your vital capacity plus residual uh, volume, okay? So this is um, when you're doing a pulmonary function test, you know, when you breathe into that tube and then the computer has these waves and stuff like that, this is what you're actually measuring, okay? And um, just know the word uh, spirometry and spirometer. Again, uh, if we had more lab time, uh, I, would bother, I would borrow the machine from, uh, we used to have a machine at uh, Falls Church and we do this experiment, but again, uh, due to COVID and um, you know constraint for time and lab time, um, gas diffusion, right? That's your ABG, arterial blood gas, and the three things that we want that are vital in an ABG, and I'll be talking about it a little bit later in this lecture, is oxygen, carbon dioxide, and your pH which is the measurement of the hydrogen ion in your blood. And that's one of the main blood, uh, um, blood tests that we do in the Department of Pulmonology, or also known as pulmonary medicine. Oh, and, and I believe, I can't remember. Definitely, if you're taking the medical college aptitude test, this definitely comes out. I can't remember if this came out as much on the, uh, on the future NCLEX. Uh, I got to review. It's been, a, it's been a couple of years since I helped somebody really review for the NCLEX. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, um, like uh, mix and match like your future training so that you can know and understand the importance of retaining this information. This will, when you take your final exam in, in three weeks from now, it won't be the last time you'll see it. You'll, you'll see it again. Now, how does my body know I need, um, I, 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 I need oxygen or I need to breathe more? Well, you have different areas in your body. And one is your medulla in your brain. And it has a respiratory center. And it has uh, the VRG, DRG, and PRG, which is the ventral respiratory group, the dorsal respiratory group, and your pontine, which is located in your pons, near your brain stem. Now, just know and understand that all of these things, um, they are looking at sensory data, right? How much, how much oxygen are you taking in? How much carbon dioxide are you throwing out? What is the... Um, what is the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide? And what is the pH of your blood? All of that gets processed in your brain. And these are the areas of your brain where it gets processed. Now, what are your sensors? You have your aortic body and your carotid body, right? You have this one sensor near your aorta and your, not near, it's like right on top of your aortic arch and another one in your neck called your carotid body. They uh, monitor what the ABG or your arterial blood gas would monitor. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide, partial pressure of oxygen, and the pH. And pH means the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion, which also means how acidic or how basic is your blood. 
So this looks like a both beautiful both A and B, right? Now, notice you'll breathe faster when you get upset. Remember, this also relates to your um, autonomic nervous system and your hypothalamus uh, connects you to that. Um, so when you're in a state of fight or flight in your uh, sympathetic nervous system, you know, you're being chased by a bear or something like that, right? It goes, um, your respiratory rate has to go up and uh, your body will sense that. Um, voluntary control, that's your cortex, part of your brain. Uh, now, pulmonary uh, irritant reflex. All along your alveoli, if there's too much foreign body, you start to cough or you start to go, ahem, 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 do one of those, right? You feel the irritants, right? Especially if, you know, you, uh, do you, do you notice like, uh, like if, if someone's perfume is too much or a noxious fume that you don't like, like, um, like, like car fumes or something like that, you start feeling your lungs uh, forcing you to cough. And that's part of your cough reflex. And by reflex, it means it doesn't, it doesn't communicate with your brain immediately. It just happens, right? It'll communicate with your brain later. Like after I cough a couple of seconds, then I realize, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I better either cover my mouth or, or move myself from the, uh, from the noxious fumes, okay? And that's your pulmonary reflexes. And if you could see here, here's your pons located in your brain. And this is your brainstem and this is your um, uh, spinal cord. Now, do you see how smart whoever built us? They put all the vital stuff deep, deep inside your brain. So you got your VRG, your ventral, right? You could see that has positive effects. So does your DRG. And your, uh, uh, and your PRG has both positive and negative effects. Don't need to know that right now, but just know that your DRG, PRG, and VRG, they're all in the area of your brainstem. And it makes sense because it's vital, it's very well protected, and it's deep, deep inside your brain. So that's why you want, you want to do, you get damage in your brain or your cortex, you know, the upper part of your brain here, your cortex. This is voluntary movement. This stuff here, your pons and, and your medulla here, that is involuntary. That is part of your autonomic nervous system. You can't control it. Uh, sleep apnea, I kind of mentioned it. Uh, not too important. You'll see that in your pathology. Oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen. Uh, and you can see here, the majority of, of the air we breathe, the majority of it is nitrogen. Only 21% is oxygen. And remember, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. If I flush an entire room full of oxygen, oxygen acts like a super, uh, um, maybe you've heard the term super oxide. It'll start burning and burning things. Um, what do you think we use oxygen, liquid oxygen for? We use it for fuel and rockets. And it, uh, it reacts very, very, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it, it's a reactant. That's why you can't smoke inside a hospital. Well, not only because it's rude and disgusting, right? even though I love smoking, right? It could, all it needs, that spark needs to get near one of those O2 tanks. And we have ourselves a rager, raging fire. Boyle's law, Henry's law. Eh, you don't need to know Henry's law yet. Um, uh, okay. Remember we talked about respiration. It's gas exchange. And you could see here at the level of the alveoli, there is gas exchange. You could see here what happens after the oxygen gets used up, right? And it rides on the hemoglobin. So does carbon dioxide. Oxygen goes in and then carbon dioxide goes out because when I'm, it goes, uh, in this particular blood vessel, there's way more carbon dioxide than there is oxygen. So 
there's way more oxygen here on the alveolar, alveolar side. So what will happen? It goes inside, right? And the carbon dioxide goes outside and it's all from pressure gradients. And after your biochemistry, you're not only gonna know this, you're also, these also have associated numbers. I'm not quite sure. Um, it's definitely for your MCAT, if, if ever any of you wanna go to medical school, but um, I can't quite remember, but definitely for NCLEX, uh, once you take your biochemistry, don't forget that stuff because uh, carbonic anhydrase, and you look at it, it's an enzyme. Enzyme that will do what? Um, uh, break down bicarbonate into water and carbon dioxide. And when I breathe out, that's what? There's water vapor and carbon dioxide. So that's another level. This is the cellular level of gas exchange. And who carries the gases? The hemoglobin molecule on your red blood cell. And doesn't that make sense? What's the majority of our, our, our blood is red blood cells. Because we have to take things in and out. Okay? And that's hemoglobin. Hemo, blood, globin, protein. Iron lung or hyperbaric chamber. And we use that when the lung pressures of my patient get all wackadoo. Um, so I, if I, you're in a hyperbaric chamber, I can now control your atmospheric pressure. We usually put people who have caissons disease or, you know, divers uh, who went up too fast. You can look at the hemoglobin molecule. It's just proteins, four sets, right? And you can see, you use your imagination. It kind of forms like lawn chairs. Here's a lawn chair. Here's another one, here's another one, and here's another one with a heme group or an iron group here. That's why you get anemia if you don't eat enough iron or if you don't eat your liver. I used to love liver when I was a kid. I don't know why I don't like it anymore. Okay, that's all biochemistry stuff. You'll learn high altitude effects. This is not a pathology class. Let's see if we did everything we needed to do. So did we talk about the structure of the respiratory system? Yep. We talked about how gas exchange and the pressures. Yep. Oxygen and carbon dioxide transport to and from cells to the lungs. Yep. Now let's talk about Message. Now we're going to talk about blood gases. Is it in discussion seven? No. By the way, next week's discussion seven, when we're talking about technology, try to get something from uh, 2020, 2021. By the way, we've been using iPhone and apps for like 10 years and telehealth for like even 20 years, but now because of COVID, telehealth now is the number one form of doctor-patient doctor consultation nowadays. Uh, and, in, uh, and not only benefits, and ma make it modern, get something from 2021, because they talked a, like, a lot of places talk a lot about the research, especially regarding efficacy of uh, telehealth. It's just a little side note. Look at lesson seven. Now, don't do the respiratory physiology lab, but what does it have? Lovely, lovely notes. Okay, on stuff that we were talking about. Okay. Now, do, 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 I thought it was here. Now, this this link you can see it's bad. But we already know how ATP is formed uh, and the electron transport, uh, transport chain. And we're not going to focus that on here. We're focusing on, um, uh, on the lung and um, uh, atmospheric, um, atmospheric and pul uh, pulmonic uh, gas exchange. Oh, it's not here. So let's go talk about it. Let's find a good. 
video on ABG. Okay, before we get into this, uh, the, 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 I like this lady, uh, registers nurse RN. I all because um, my do, uh, my daughter years ago when she was uh, preparing uh, for her NCLEX. Uh, when did she prepare for her NCLEX? She graduated year now. Oh wow, yeah, that was like five six years ago. Time really flies. Um, she used to watch these videos by this lady, uh, registered nurse RN. Um, uh, also, the Khan Academy has some uh, stuff, but um, I was asked by the School of Nursing, we typically wouldn't go over this, um, but uh, like I said, you guys are not doing very well in your classes. Uh, well, not you per se, but uh, the current um, nurse candidates are in nursing. There's a lot of you failing a lot of classes, and one of the classes that that is very, very uh, popular in failing is pathology. And in theory, if you did well in anatomy and physiology, you should do well in pathology because all pathology is, is just messing with the normal. But like I said, how much of this do you really retain when you go over to the, um, and then they complain a lot like, oh, they don't explain anything to us. They shouldn't explain anything. You should know all of this already when you're there. And that's the rough part of, uh, so that's why I always tell everybody, take two classes at a time, try not to rush. Some of, some of the nurse candidates um, want three and four classes. By the way, those are the people who fail. Don't, don't rush into it. And also those are the people who fail their NCLEX. Savor your education, do it right the first time. I made that same mistake and I got nailed in graduate school. I, I, I rushed through I rushed through um, undergraduate. I had a double major and I finished it in three and a half years because um, you know, I was running out of money. But if I had to do it all over again, I would have just put everything on the card and I would have went slower. And I went slower in graduate school. I finished my first master's degree in three and a half years on a two year program because I took it slow and I did it better. And then so what happened when I went to medical school the big show, I was more prepared and I survived while a whole bunch of other people didn't. And it's because of retention. It's, a, it's of course, understanding that everything you're learning, you're learning for a reason. And it's not just for an exam. It's for you to understand your job when you get out there. And the best nurses are the ones who um, understand protocol. And one of, one of the things that you do is these things called ABG, or arterial blood gas, which is uh, a very, very common test uh, um, in the hospital. She is dominating nursing school, excelling in all of her nursing classes and acing. Hey everyone, this is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and today I want to be talking to you about the tic-tac-toe method and how to use it when solving arterial blood gas problems. In nursing school, you'll be required to learn like arterial gas. blood gas. Where, where is her basics? Maybe I'll go into it. You know what? I said basics. Tic-tac-toe is ready when you want to. I just want to explain, and then we're going to get into. All right, let's do this one. I never tried mint nursing. What is going on, guys? Dawn checking oh. in. Welcome to Mint, where we bring nursing to you. Oh, well, he is enthusiastic. So today we are going to talk about the easiest way to interpret your arterial blood gases. So if you're ready, we're ready, let's go. Hello, this is the three-step ABG interpretation. But before we dive in into the actual steps, let us talk about basic concepts that you need to know for this lecture. Starting with, what is ABG? ABG stands for arterial blood gases. Arterial blood gases are simply the measurements of the acidity or alkalinity of the arterial circulation. It also measures gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now we are going to talk about four important components that are in your ABG. And those are your pH, your CO2 or carbon dioxide, your HCO3 or bicarbonate, 
your PaO2 or oxygen. And we're going to talk about them one by one, starting with your pH. The pH is pretty much the measurement of how acidic or alkalotic the blood is. Your normal value for your pH is 7.35 to 7.45. And we are going to talk about the significance of these numbers later on. Next component would be your PaCO2. Your PaCO2 is pretty much the measurement of carbon dioxide. And our normal value for this is 35 to 45. Now it is easy to remember 35 to 45 because if you look at our pH, your pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So just remember, 35 to 45 for carbon dioxide. Another concept that I need you guys to remember about PaCO2 or carbon dioxide is that it is being controlled by your lungs. Of course, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Another thing that I want you to relate with carbon dioxide would be acid. Now, I'm not saying that carbon dioxide is an acid. What we're trying to get here is that the amount of carbon dioxide is directly proportional to the number of hydrogen ions being produced, which is related to acid. We're not going to discuss biochemistry here, but all I'm saying is that the more carbon dioxide you have in your blood, the more acidic your blood is. If you look at your normal value here, 35 to 45, if your number is above 45, which indicates that there is more carbon dioxide in your blood, then your blood tends to be on the acidic side. On the other hand, if your value is less than 35, your blood tends to be on the basic side. Next up is your HCO3. Your HCO3 is your bicarbonate. Your normal value for your bicarbonate is 22 to 26. The bicarbonate is being controlled by your kidneys. And just to maintain the pH within the normal range, your lungs and your kidneys tend to work hand in hand to maintain a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And we will talk about that later on today when we talk about compensation. Earlier, I mentioned that when you see carbon dioxide, Okay, just a little bit extra. Alkalinity is the same thing as saying base. So on one side of the pH scale is acid, and on the other side is base. So the pH scale is 1 through 14, and around 7 is neutral. And you could see physiologic pH is 7.35 to 7.45. And um, you can now see that there are two compensating mechanisms regarding um, pH. One is, of course, your breathing. And those of us who work out know that if you don't breathe very well, especially if you're running or whatever, you start to cramp up. When you start cramping up, it forms lactic acid. When there's too much carbon dioxide it, uh, in your system, it combines with the hydrogen ion and makes carbonic acid and, that, and, and, and lactic acid as well. So one compensation is I'll breathe faster. And that's why when you work out or when you're running or when you're uh, exerting yourself, your breathing will become faster because there's a greater buildup of carbon dioxide. Now what's bicarbonate? Bicarbonate is, um, there's a buffer system in your pH system. Your body likes being in the middle. So if you're too much, if it goes, um, if you're too acidic, your kidneys are going to release bicarbonate. Another thing that we already know that your kidneys do, it's going to start throwing out um, hydrogen ions. Hence the term pH, or the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion atom. And that the hydrogen ion, if there's a lot, that's acid. So if there's a lot, you're going to have an increase of carbon dioxide. You're going to also have an increase of bicarbonate. All right. So um, right now, Look at it in a very basic way. You don't need to know the numbers for my exam, but definitely start memorizing these numbers because definitely for your uh, future nursing classes, you're definitely gonna need to know this. And um, some of those videos that I showed you, they're really helpful on uh, interpreting. But for my exam, I'll ask you, what's pH? What's normal pH? It should be around seven. If it's closer to one, my patient is acidic. If it's closer to 14, my patient is alkaline or basic. PaCO2 means the partial arterial pressure of carbon dioxide, right? If I have way too much carbon dioxide, I'll have way too much acid. What's bicarbonate, HCO3? That is the buffer if there's too much acid. And of course, PaO2 is the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. 
All right, and now onward with the video. Relate that with acid. If you see bicarbonate, think about base. The more bicarbonate you have in your blood, the more basic your blood is. If your bicarbonate is more than 26, your blood tends to be on the basic side. On the other hand, if it's less than 22, that means you don't have enough bicarbonate in your blood. Your blood tends to be on the acidic side. Lastly, is your PaO2 or oxygen. This is also being regulated by our lungs and our normal value for this is 80 to 100. Now, although this is important for us to check when reading our patient's ABG, we don't really need the number when it comes to interpreting whether your patient is having respiratory or metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. This simply will tell us whether your patient is having hypoxemia or not. But Am I say disregard PaO2 all completely? Of course not. Just for the sake of the lecture, when you need to interpret your ABG, whether it's metabolic or respiratory, acidosis or alkalosis, you just need to look at your pH, your PaCO2, and your HCO3. Does your patient have hypoxemia? Look at the PaO2. And anyway, we're going to know if my patient has hypoxemia because that little thing that we put on their finger, right, that's already going to uh, the pulse oximeter is already going to tell me a lot. And also, we're gonna, you're going to look at all the other things about your patient. Now, you'll notice that pH, pH, CO2, and bicarb are the primary things, and he wrote, wrote them first. And they're primary because what your body really senses isn't the oxygen level. Because remember, there's only 21% in atmospheric anyway. It's the CO2 level that we're concerned about, right? And that's the thing that really controls uh, controls breathing, um, metabolically and chemical biochemically in your body. It's CO2. It's not the O2. Again, your pH refers to the acidity or alkalinity of your blood. And the normal value is 7.35 to 7.45. Your PaCO2 is your carbon dioxide, which the normal value is 35 to 45. And when you see carbon dioxide, think about acid. HCO3, your bicarbonate, your normal value is 22 to 26. And when you think about bicarbonate, think about base. And lastly, your PaO2, your oxygen, it is 80 to 100. Unfortunately, there is no other way around this, but just do memorize these numbers. But if you do memorize these numbers, trust me on this. Interpreting ABGs will be a breeze for you guys. Now, let us talk about the actual three-step ABG interpretation. And these are... Okay. Now, this is now beyond the scope of my class, but I've been asked by nursing to play the, uh, to, uh, to teach you guys this so that um, when you guys go to your pathology class and your med surge classes, that you this wouldn't be the first time you saw this, okay? So this is not for the exam, but this is for your knowledge for things that you need to know, um, uh, which is um, ABG arterial blood gas, all right? And also, it may it's 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 nice because it's a it's a it's a nice preview of the, all the cool things you're gonna get to learn in the near future. Identify if it is acidosis or alkalosis by looking at your pH. Identify if it is respiratory or metabolic by looking at your carbon dioxide. And those are the two compensatory mechanisms of, uh, of our lungs. If it is compensated or uncompensated. First step is identifying whether it is acidosis or alkalosis. Again, our normal value for our pH is 7.35 to 7.45. If your pH is less than 7.35, you have acidosis. If it is greater than 7.45, you have alkalosis. Let's see some example. For a pH of 7.25, it's less than 7.35, so you have acidosis. Another example pH of 7.55 is greater than 7.45. So what do you have? You have alkalosis. Step number two would be identifying if it is respiratory or metabolic. And we're going to do this by simply looking at your bicarbonate and carbon dioxide and compare that to your pH. Through this, we will know whether you have respiratory or metabolic condition. And the method that we are going to be using will be the concept method. Now, the most common method being taught in nursing school is what we call the Rome method, where they ask you to use arrows in interpreting your ABGs. 
However, we will not be using this here because the row method doesn't really work well for compensated ABG. So for now, we are just sticking with the concept method. So what is the concept method? We talked about this earlier already, and that is carbon dioxide is being regulated by your lungs while the bicarbonate is being regulated by your kidneys. If your carbon dioxide level is abnormal while this bicarbonate is normal, you have a respiratory condition. On the other hand, if your carbon dioxide is normal while this is abnormal, you have a metabolic condition. And just to throw it out there, remember that carbon dioxide is to acid while bicarbonate is to base. It is best if we use examples for this method. 7.25, PaCO2 of 50, and bicarbonate of 24. Looking at the pH, we can tell that this is acid. So right off the bat, this is what your exams look like. They give you data and then they'll ask you a multiple choice questions, just like the NCLEX. And that this is this is nice because he's doing it in a um, in a visual, but you're gonna have to learn how to uh, take you know words. Like it'll do it'll do this. They'll actually give you like a little slip of, of the report, and they won't say what's asked for. The, what's respiratory, what's metabolic. So again, for my test purposes, you could see the two compensations that we have when there's a problem. We already now know there's a problem because the pH is not normal. It's under, well, the pH is actually, uh, yeah, it's a little bit on the acidic side, but you could see there's compensations, there's respiratory compensations and there's metabolic compensations. So part of the ABG interpretation is to figure out which one is dominant. So, and you can also see that your lungs, even though we learn it in a separate chapter, you can see your lungs, your kidneys, your cardiovascular, everything's connected. But we try to, um, you try to separate it um, for, you know, for clarity. But get, try to learn how, like on the side of your paper to make a picture like this. Like, you know, draw a quick kidney, draw a lung so that you know that, your PaCO2, I'm thinking respiratory, your bicarbonate, I'm thinking metabolic, and I'm thinking more acidic for CO2 and more basic for bicarb. The doses are normal at 7.35 to 7.45. It's less than 35, so it is acidosis. Look at the PaCO2, it's elevated. Our normal value is 35 to 45. We have 50. Just by simply looking at that, this is abnormal, and if you look at the bicarbonate, it is normal. Our normal value is 22 to 26. So this is normal, this is abnormal. What do we have? We have a respiratory condition. Therefore, we have respiratory acidosis. And just by simply looking at the PaCO2, 50, that means you went beyond 45. If you have more CO2, your blood is more acidic. So respiratory acidosis makes sense here. And of course, your bicarbonate, it's normal. Another example, pH of 7.56, PaCO2 of 28, and bicarbonate of 22. The pH. Okay, I'll give you guys a minute to write it on a piece of paper or just look at it. Out of these three, which ones are normal? Is this normal? Is this normal? Is this normal? And then you ask yourself, okay, once you know which one's abnormal, then what's going on? Is it, go, first you always ask yourself, is it, uh, is it normal, acidic, or basic? And is it a respiratory problem or is it a metabolic problem? What does this tell us? Is it acidosis or alkalosis? It's alkalosis, it's more than 45. Looking at the PaCO2, our normal is 35 to 45. It's less than 35 to 45. Look at their bicarbonate. Is this normal? 22 to 26, it's normal. So since your PaCO2 is abnormal, we have a respiratory condition. Therefore, it's respiratory alkalosis. And if you look at the PaCO2, we don't have enough acid in our blood. That means it's making our blood more basic. So respiratory alkalosis, will make sense. And of course, our bar carbonate is normal. What about this? 7.25, PaCO2 of 37, and bicarbonate of 21. Looking at our pH, is this acidosis or alkalosis? 
it is acidosis. Looking at our PaCO2, our normal is 35 to 45. So this is normal. Looking at our bicarbonate, our normal is 22 to 26. Since our abnormal is the bicarbonate and the CO2 is normal, do we have a metabolic or a respiratory? We have a metabolic condition. And since this is acidosis, we have metabolic acidosis. Think about this for a second. Our normal is 22 to 26. We don't have enough base in our blood. That means our blood is more on the acidic side. So metabolic acidosis does make sense. Another example, 7.56. We have 44 to our carbon dioxide and bicarbonate of 35. Looking at the pH, we have alkalosis. Our PaCO2, it's normal. Our normal is 35 to 45. And our bicarbonate is 35. Since our abnormal is bicarbonate and the CO2 is normal, we have a metabolic condition. And we relate that with our pH, we have a metabolic alkalosis. And this makes sense because the more bicarbonate you have, the more basic your blood is. Now, you guys might be wondering, what if your PaCO2 is abnormal and your bicarbonate is abnormal? Or what if your pH is normal and both of them are abnormal. You have to remember that the examples that we just used just now, these are examples of uncompensated ABGs. If your pH becomes normal and both of them are abnormal, we have compensation going on. We're going to talk about that in step number three, which is identifying whether it is compensated or uncompensated. My twin brother, Ben, will be explaining more about this. So Ben, Take it away. Thank you, Don. So we have learned steps one and step two of reading ABGs. Step number three is identifying whether there is a full compensation or partial compensation. So let's get right to it. After identifying whether it's acidosis or alkalosis and whether it's respiratory or metabolic, we immediately go to the compensatory component of the problem. When we have a respiratory problem, always remember that our metabolic will compensate. That is our bicarbonate. Whether it's acidosis or alkalosis, the body will try to compensate by either increasing or decreasing the amount of bicarbonate in our system. When we have respiratory acidosis, the body will try to compensate by increasing the amount of bicarbonate in our system. Remember, bicarbonate is a base, so one of its function is to neutralize the acid that's causing the problem. When we have respiratory alkalosis, it's going to do the opposite. The body will compensate by decreasing the amount of bicarbonate. For us to conclude that there's compensation, the increase or decrease has to go outside the normal range. So it has to be higher than 26 or it has to be less than 22. If the bicarb is still within normal limits, then there is no compensation going on. Okay, moving forward. When we have a metabolic problem. So if you're thinking of bicarb as a base, it has, to, I guess, if you're acidotic, you have to start offloading your kidneys have to start making a whole bunch of bicarb. And you know the range is 22 to 26, so it has to be greater than 26. Now, if you know that bicarb equals base, if you're having alkalosis, that means I gotta drop, your kidneys have to drop the base or drop the bicarb, and they have to drop it underneath the value of 22, right? Because the range is 22 to 26. And that is, metabolic uh, um, um, metabolic compensation. Always remember that our respiratory system will compensate. So that is our carbon dioxide. So again, depending whether it's acidosis or alkalosis, the body will try to compensate by either increasing or decreasing the amount of CO2 in our system. When we have metabolic acidosis, the body will compensate by decreasing the amount of CO2. Remember, CO2 is associated with acid. So when the body detects that there's acidosis, obviously it's going to try to decrease the amount of CO2 in our system. When we have metabolic alkalosis, it's going to do the opposite. The body will try to compensate by increasing the amount of CO2 in our system. And just like in respiratory, for us to conclude that there is compensation going on, the decrease or increase has to be outside the normal range. So it has to be and you see, if you memorize your normal ranges, then, then you know acidosis, you have to drop it underneath its lower range. 
And if it's alkalosis, I have to increase it uh, greater than your range. Now, my advice is, is like to, to go like well, for future, future training, future stuff, you go and take as many practice examples as you can so that you get used to it. And then you'll find that you'll, you'll memorize the steps. Right now, it may seem a little bit much, uh, but do you see how it goes in steps? And do you see how it makes sense if you know and understand what things mean? So bicarbonate, I know that's what? Metabolic. Carbon dioxide, it's respiratory. And if, if I'm acidotic, and I wanna get rid of carbon dioxide, how do you get rid of carbon dioxide? You exhale. So if you're acidotic, what's your respiratory compensation gonna be? <sighs> you're, gonna in, you're gonna increase the amount of times you uh, exhale. Therefore, you're gonna increase the amount of your respiratory rate. And that's exactly what happens in my patient who has acidosis. They're gonna start breathing faster to compensate for your uh, CO2, right? And if my patient has alkalosis, I wanna to try to keep the CO2. So what's gonna happen? They're gonna start breathing slower because I want to keep the CO2 because we already learned in the first part of this video that CO2 is associated with acid. Less than 35 or greater than 45. Otherwise, there's no compensation going on. So let's use some examples. pH is 7.30, CO2 is 50, bicarbonate is 49. So first step is to identify whether this is alkalosis or acidosis. Looking at the pH, that's lower than the normal range. So we know that this is acidosis. Next step is to identify whether it's a respiratory or a metabolic problem. So let's go to our CO2. Our CO2 is 50. That's a lot of CO2. And remember, CO2 is associated with acid. So we can conclude that increased amount of CO2 is the reason why we have an acidosis problem. So we can put here respiratory acidosis. Because we have a respiratory problem, our next step is to look at our bicarb and it's 49. This simply means that the body detected that there is a respiratory acidosis and it tries to compensate by increasing the amount of base in our system. So we know that there is compensation. Now question, is this a full compensation or a partial compensation? To answer that question, all we have to do is look at our pH. Looking at this, our compensation was not enough to bring pH back to normal. So this is only a partial compensation. So remember, so you see there, the first part is, if only one of these two things are off, then you could definitely say if it's respiratory or metabolic, acidosis or alkalosis based on the pH. But when both of these two are messed up, that means there's something complex more going on. Partial compensation only occurs when the pH doesn't come back to normal. Full compensation occurs when the pH comes back to normal. Does anyone have any questions on this? Because I know, I guess, I know it's a little much, and I will have this uh, this video um, 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 in our announcements along with my video. But uh, I just wanted you to um, uh, to see fully the the application of your biochemistry, anatomy, and physiology uh, all put together, and you could see how very complex a uh, typical NCLEX question is. Oh, by the way, they won't stop there. The, then the, a typical pathology question is, okay, fine. You went through all of these steps and you have partial compensation. Uh, it goes, uh, which of the following pathologies does my patient have? And then you have to know from your pathology lectures, which of the following things have partial, which of the following things have full compensation. And then that's more stuff. Or do they have a cardiac problem? that's uh, uh, representing as an ABG problem. So you could see, I can, I can easily see why pathology is one of those high value targets in um, School of Nursing. And uh, I speak to my other colleagues in other schools of nursing, pathology, pharmacology, med surge, all of them, all of them are rough, not because, not because they're really complex, it's because you have to start integrating things and pulling knowledge from different classes all in one thing. Um, so that's, uh, that's your um, lecture in a nutshell. Let's look at 
your case for next week, case study in cellular rep respiration. Yeah, do all the questions. There's not that many, there's about 12 or so. So kindly do all the questions in the mystery of the seven deaths. And uh, uh, most of you do, do it fine. I don't have any real issue. And of course, uh, discussion, keep it to 2021. And, uh, um, and you know, and you know how to do your concept maps. So does anyone have any questions on, on what we just discussed today? On the last part, it's a little bit on the hefty side, but the worst I'm gonna do to you is I'm gonna give you like one snippet of it. And I'll also, if I ask you about acidosis or alkalosis, I will put the ranges there right on the exam so that you know you could check. So let's um, let's do an example of that. So um, I had a question. Yeah, shoot, go ahead. When you have acidosis, uh, besides breathing faster, is there any other symptoms? If my patient's acidosis, if they don't, if they're asymptomatic. Yeah, like you 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 uh, mentioned some symptoms like breathing too slow or breathing too fast. So besides yeah. those two, is there any other symptoms? Oh, there's a ton. There's a ton. That's in your pathology class. And there's dozens. Oh, okay. That's, and then here's the problem. Students try to memorize all of them. Even in medical school, they were trying to memorize everything. Um, my pathology book was, I believe, 2,000 pages long. You, there's no way you can do it. But if you, stand, if you understand your anatomy and physiology. Now, can my patient have a really messed up ABG and be asymptomatic? You betcha. Diabetics. Um, my last diabetic coma patient, she was looking right at me the hour before she died. She's looking at me. She's like, doc, I feel a little dizzy. You know, I'm sorry. I wasn't on my diet and I gained a couple of pounds and she was making all these excuses. And then I'm like, all right. I, I went downstairs to the ER. I saw another patient, uh, 35 minutes later, she's coded, uh, 25 minutes later, I called it. Her ABG was, um, uh, was uh, partial metabolic acidosis compensated. Um, and I had to present why uh, did she die so quick? So um, remember, ABG is just a tool. It doesn't tell you everything. It tells you just a little snippet. And now you could also see the complexity of just one simple test. Just imagine if I ran 13 tests, which is typical of your multisystemic patient, right? That's the doctor's job to go interpret it. And that's why your MCAT and your NCLEX, they're very complex. Uh, and it requires more than one leap. You know what I'm saying? Like you could see how in just that simple three lines of an ABG, how complex you could make it. Now just multiply that by stuff like I do like, um, um, you know, your electrolytes and chemistries. If I do a full panel, that's 26 tests. So that's 26 things, 26 variables that I have to go figure out. And then things get really hairy after that, right? And uh, a good nurse and a good physician can break things down into parts and, and apply it to anatomy and physiology. So let's, let's, try, let's try some, um, uh, let's try a, um, like a sample question that would kind of be on uh, my exam. So my patient's ABG is, uh, reports uh, a pH of uh, 7.25. What can we say about our patient? So my exam would be alcohol. Alkalosis. Um, oh, right. and then I'll put normal value. Uh, and sometimes they, they use the word reference. Is uh, okay. So what would it be? If this is my normal value. And 7.25 is the left of this value. Is my patient acidotic, alkalotic, both or neither? Anybody? 
What would the answer be? And just like that guy's, uh, that guy's lecture, right? He gave you every possible. So do you think you can go home and give and write yourself every possible thing, right? Um, my patient's ABG uh, reports a bicarb of. Uh, Wait, let me, how's this? Let me post the, the normal values. That'll be easier to do instead of writing it every time. Uh, images. There you go. So I could put this like on the top of the page or something like that, right? And then uh, I I, uh, I could ask uh, a question like this, or I could ask um, uh, my patient's PCO2, uh, or I said bicarb, my patient's bicarb is uh, 20. Was it no grams of deciliter or MEX? Is no equivalence MEX. So what would they have? Um, uh, would it be um, um, Wait, I can't spell. And if I know that the reference value is 22 to 26, right? I know it's what? Too little. So too little bicarb. Bicarb is too little base. So the answer has got to be what? Metabolic acidosis. And the answer to this. Uh, My patient is 7.25. My patient would be acidotic. How do I get out of this? Okay, so that's the kind of thing that you could practice at home and uh, or heck, just Google what? Like, well, not necessarily for my class, but there's a whole bunch of practice periods, but and remember, because if you practice enough, it becomes second nature. And it's the same thing for math, um, for, for your math class. The more you practice, um, uh, um, the, um, the easier it gets. Um, right now, of course, uh, like my youngest, oh, not, she's not my youngest, but my 13 year old, she's pretty good at math. But what do you think I'm doing over the summer months? Just two hours a day, every day, math. What's going to happen to her math when she goes back to school in September? She's practicing every day when everyone else is asleep, when everyone else is on vacation or at the beach. These are what medical professionals do. We train, we practice, and we work while the rest of the world gets to go to the beach. So that's also something to think about for those of you who are like, oh, it's summer, I gotta go on vacation. I, have, I haven't been on a vacation in decades. And the last time I was on a vacation officially, three years ago, I was at a medical conference, um, getting another certificate, um, getting more continuing medical education while my, while my family got to go to the beach, okay? Have that culture, have that, I guess, have that discipline because those are the people who do well in this, uh, those in the nursing and medical service. Does anyone have any questions on what we did today?
or what is due or what is due next week or what is due today. Because if we're good, I got uh, one, two, three, four, five people uh, kindly log off and I will see you guys on campus next week. And if you can't make it, please give me a call so I can make sure that I bring my laptop and uh, so you guys can be in on the dissection. And I believe our first dissection is cardiac. Uh, so we we'll need cutting up, uh, I can't remember if I have the big hearts or the little hearts. Um, I should have a couple of the big hearts left. And by big, I mean the size of a basketball big, which is really neat because we can really, really see uh, um, uh, the structures. And uh, I think, I'm not quite sure if we're doing kidney, but definitely next week, um, I'm, I'm the week after that, we're definitely doing a full dissection of the pig from snout to tail. So if no one has any questions, comments, or recipes, kindly log off to connote that you're, you're good. And I will- I, I have a question. Shoot, go ahead. 